Hello and welcome to this presentation on the Child Protection Situation and Response Monitoring Toolkit. My name is Hani Mansourian um, and I'm an advisor with the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, formerly known as the Child Protection Working Group. Um, and I've been working for the past couple of years with um, the Child Protection Working Group and the Area of Responsibility on uh, developing this toolkit to help us um, better monitor the work that we do and also better monitor the situation of children so that we can adapt our response to the, the real needs um, of children in humanitarian context. Um, this is the first part of a multi-part um, e-learning course that is meant to make you guys um, familiar with this toolkit um, from the reasons why it was developed all the way to the process of the development and also the technical aspect in terms of methodology sampling uh, of both situation and response monitoring and uh, this particular session um, is the overview uh, and we will continue with the other parts in the near future. The learning objectives of this session are to make you guys familiar with the reasons behind the development of uh, the Child Protection Monitoring Toolkit. Uh, also provide you with uh, an idea of the outline of this, uh, uh, and, and the structure of this toolkit and uh, speak a little bit about the main components of the toolkit. So just to provide you with a little bit of a background of uh, where it all started and what the process has been, the need for a toolkit of this sort was identified through feedback that we received from um, the field, from people like yourself who have been working in uh, humanitarian context on protection of children. Um, in many occasions when the Child Protection Working Group um, or the subcluster was, was providing, su providing support to field coordinators or individual agencies who have been active in, um, in uh, humanitarian context, we would basically receive a request um, on having some sort of a mechanism um, that would allow NGOs and uh, the coordination mechanism to be able to monitor the situation of children independent of, of, the pro of their programs, but also better monitor the, their own programs and the response that they're providing. Um, so we know that individual agencies have been doing program monitoring for a long time, um, partly because they wanted to know how they're doing, but also because the donors normally request um, for information on how the programs are going. Um, so that part is slightly more advanced, but the part that is that we have kind of been struggling with in the sector, in the child protection sector uh, more is the the aspect of situation monitoring, which is basically tr uh, trying to look at the situation of children rather than what we are doing for them. Uh, and without that, our programs may not be relevant to the needs of, of children, um, because especially in chronic emergencies, if you start a program uh, today based on some sort of an assessment of needs, six months later, the situation on the ground might have changed, but our programs may remain the same. So situation monitoring could potentially help us get a sense of those changes um, so that we can adapt our programs. So this feedback kept coming from the field um, and within the assessment and measurement task force, which is now known as assessment, measurement and evidence working group. Um, there was a long discussion about what, what to do about this. And finally, we came to the conclusion that a, a toolkit, a global guidance and toolkit will 
is, is needed for these two aspects, which are situation and response monitoring. Um, so that's how it kind of all came about, the whole idea started. And um, we were lucky to get some funding from an OFDA um, with some other funding from the Canadian government and also some really generous, generous support from the German government to make this possible. Um, an advisory group or committee was formed. Uh, Columbia University was part, part of it, the Child Protection Working Group, OCHA, Save the Children, and UNICEF. And of course, it's, a, it's an open forum, so if any NGOs uh, would like to join this effort um, in the capacity of, of the advisory committee, they would be more than welcome. Um, the beginning of the process was uh, designed to involve country visits to basically get a sense of what the countries need in terms of monitoring the response and the situation of children. Um, this happened in 2014 and 15. Um, five countries were visited, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, and South Sudan. Uh, during these visits, uh, workshops were held with, with uh, stakeholders, NGOs, the UN, uh, donors to basically get a realistic sense of the situation in terms of uh, monitoring activities and the need of, uh, of those who are actually programming and managing programs. Um, Based on the country visits, the first draft was um, was created since then, which is almost a year now. Um, we have done four rounds of revisions uh, based on feedback from the field, feedback from the advisory committee, um, and also feedback from our pilot that is happening in South Sudan, which takes me to the last point on this slide. Um, we do have an active pilot going on currently in South Sudan. Um, it started in December 2015. The preparatory work was done in country and since then um, with support from the global um, area of responsibility, um, the South Sudan subcluster, child protection subcluster, with uh, very active and generous support from UNICEF has been pushing through with uh, the rollout of this, of this um, mechanism, basically the child protection monitoring mechanism. Um, as early as uh, May, um, the rollout started. Um, there has been a lot of preparatory work going into it, and uh, data is now being collected. And soon we will have a session, um, a review session, basically in a, in a few months in South Sudan to see how the system is working and how it can be improved. So let's get to some fundamental definitions that will be with us throughout uh, this course. Um, the first one is situation monitoring. Um, what does it mean? Basically is an ongoing and coordinated data collection and analysis of child protection risks, concerns, violations, and capacities in a given context to inform programming. Um, there are a few very important elements in this definition that I will try to highlight here. Um, the first one is it needs to be ongoing in the sense that an assessment, for example, which is something that you do one off, you collect data on the situation of children, is not considered situation monitoring um, because it's, uh, it, it doesn't give you the sense of change or trends. Um, the other aspect of this is coordinated data collection in the sense that um, this particular guidance and toolkit is designed to cater towards uh, a humanitarian context where there is a coordin coordinated effort to respond. Um, so I would say, for example, in a very small scale emergency where there is only one um, NGO or two NGOs that are responding uh, to humanitarian context, you may be able to do other kind of monitoring, but this this specific type of monitoring might be a little too heavy for, 
for a small scale emergency uh, where there are not multiple actors in, in play. So, and this, when we say coordinated, it doesn't necessarily mean cluster system. It can be within the clusterized environment, but also in non clusterized environments, including refugee contexts. Um, this can be used. Um, the other very important element here is um, data collection and analysis in the sense that analysis needs to be done on an ongoing basis as well. It's not, it's not data that we collect and gather over time and then every six months or every year we decide, okay, now let's look at the data um, and analyze it. No, there needs to be a built-in mechanism for you to analyze the data as they come in. Um, it can be real time in the sense that every single data point that comes in feeds into the analysis or it can be on a regular basis. So it can be every month or every two weeks or every two months based on what you decide within the, within the coordination mechanism. The other component of this um, is what we monitor, which is child protection risk concerns, violations, which are more understood and capacities. So what we mean by capacities is that we also want to make sure that we focus on how communities and, and the society itself um, is responding to these risks and concerns and violations. And the, the importance of that is falls with uh, the idea that if the capacity exists either from the government or from communities themselves to respond to certain risks and concerns and violations, um, then our response will be very different than if you find out that there are certain risks and violations and there's no capacity to respond to it, or there's very limited capacity to respond to it. Um, so it's important for to know about capacities to be able to respond well. And the last piece that is the last element that is really important in this definition is to inform programming. Um, and what, what we mean by that is that we are not collecting data for a study or for the sake of just having data so that we can maybe one day look at it. The idea is for it to be an integrated part of our response. We want the data that comes out of situation monitoring to inform what we are doing to respond to the needs on an ongoing basis. Um, and that means sometimes adjusting your programs, your existing programs, sometimes by a lot, you adjust it by a lot because all of a sudden the situation has really changed or you adjust it slightly because, for example, before your data showed you that separation affects ch younger children more than older children. So children under 12, let's say, are getting affected more. But then six months later, your situation monitoring data shows you that now there's the pattern has shifted and ch older children, um, so children above the age of 12 or maybe above the age of 15, are getting affected more by separation. Or this might be about child labor or recruitment or any of those child protection issues. Um, so... One is adjusting your programs. The other is sometimes new risks and, and violations start showing up that didn't exist before. For example, if you had done an assessment early on in a, uh, in, in an, after an, an upsurge in, um, in, in the conflict, uh, let's say in a, in a uh, protracted emergency that has been going on for a while, there has been an upsurge you collect data, you see that there is there are certain types of uh, violations going on. But you don't necessarily, for example, see an escalation of sexual violence. Six months later, you do another look at the data, or as the data comes in, six months later, you start seeing that sexual violence or increase in sexual violence is, is a new phenomenon that has been happening that didn't wasn't an issue, or at least you didn't detect it six months earlier. That may then require you to go back to your donors and say, we need um, to do specific programming for sexual violence because now we know that it's an issue. 
The next definition that we need to focus on that will be helpful throughout the, the course is response monitoring, which is the other component within this um, toolkit. Response monitoring is defined as ongoing and coordinated measurement of coverage and quality of emergency response in a humanitarian context. Again, elements that are important, ongoing and coordinated, similar to what I described for situation monitoring. Um, another two elements that are very important are coverage and quality of emergency response. Um, coverage in the sense of who are we reaching? Um, what kind of services are we providing to them? Uh, which is something that we do to a certain degree monitor in a lot of humanitarian contexts. Uh, as you know, for example, the, the who does what where tool um, is meant to capture some of the coverage. The other aspect that is less um, attended to in humanitarian context is the quality of programming or a response. Um, and this aspect is probably the most novel aspect of our response monitoring um, recommendations within the within the toolkit and it hopefully will help us as a sector to better monitor how well we are doing in terms of our response uh, so that we can basically claim that we're not just covering a certain number of children but we are actually providing them quality response um, and yeah, so we move on. So now let's get to the toolkit itself. Um, this is the general structure of the toolkit, which starts with an introduction fundamentals. It goes into how situation monitoring is recommended to be done, how response mon monitoring is recommended to be done. And then it goes into some key steps of, for establishing a, a monitoring system. It talks about indicators, sampling, and selection of participants, um, and also data collection and data analysis and sharing the results. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail of these in the next slides, but just to make this a bit more um, palatable and easier to, to digest, we put them into a few different boxes. So. There are four main components to the toolkit. One is the basics. It basically has two sections, one introduction, one to fundamentals. Introduction talks about um, how this came about and fundamentals talks about the, the definitions and, and how situation response monitoring relate to other um, kind of processes that happen in the humanitarian response. Then methodology talks about how situation monitoring should be done, response monitoring should be done, and what sampling and selection processes are. As you see there, those fall under section three, four, and seven. Um, then planning and rollout, it, the first um, part that talks about that is the key steps section, which is section five, and then section six kind of helps us get a sense of the indicators. Uh, the indicators kind of section kind of falls within multiple different components, but we thought it best fits on their planning and rollout. Um, then there's data management aspect, which includes data collection and, and the staffing that is required for data collection, and also data analysis and uh, sharing of results. The introduction part, um, which goes from page five to six, um, it basically outlines the purpose of the toolkit. Um, and it helps us understand where it should be um, used. It describes what the toolkit is, what it is not, which is also as important as what it is, and who it's designed for and where it should be used, and a few other things. The fundamental section provides definitions of child protection emergencies, uh, which uses the child protection working group um, definition, situation monitoring, response monitoring, and it also describes some of the linkages between situation monitoring and, um, and other measurement efforts and response monitoring and other measurement efforts, such as assessments and evaluations. Um, it also explains some of the ethical considerations that have to be um, looked at when uh, before you plan the data collection and the 
The situation monitoring section, which goes from page 9 to 19, so it's about 10 pages, um, it does introduce the two main approaches to data collection that is used in situation monitoring. One is sec secondary data review, also referred to as desk review. Um, the second is primary data collection. Um, as some of you probably know, um, secondary data is referred to any kind of data source that already exists. So it's, it's data that is collected for other purposes, but also can serve our purpose. So any report, any um, kind of evaluation of programs, any assessments that has been done in the past, sometimes even newspaper articles um, and, and, re and journalistic reporting can be used as secondary data. And during secondary data review, what we do is we collect those data, um, compile them and analyze them, uh, and present them in a, in a digestible format. Primary data, on the other hand, is a type of data that you collect for, the, for your purposes, for the objective that you have for this particular activity. So in this case, for the monitoring process. Um, it's data that um, normally comes in some sort of either quantitative or qualitative form uh, and you compile it in a systematic way and analyze it and report on. For the primary data collection component, there are two methodologies that are proposed within this toolkit. One is a community-based situation monitoring, the other is agency-based situation monitoring. Um, Community-based situation monitoring basically recommends setting up um, community networks or using existing community networks uh, to, to systematically collect data on the protection of children or risks to, to the protection of children. This, um, of course, requires um, a certain level of um, of active involvement from the community so in different contexts it, it takes different forms for example in south sudan there were already child protection community networks that have been set up um, which involve community members in protection of children we try to tap into to that existing mechanism and use use it to collect data and different methods including mobile based data collection or paper-based data collection, depending on the context, can be used for this uh, methodology. The other methodology, the agency-based, basically requires agencies that are providing the response to uh, to, to, to different um, needs of children who are present in different parts of the country to take on the responsibility of collecting data on the situation of, of children. Um, so it basically uses the existing network of NGOs and, and CBOs, community-based organizations, to tap to, taps into that expertise that exists within them and gets them to collect the data and send it. Um, it then, this one, of course, requires potentially a, a more um, significant investment from the part of the agencies because they they're using their own staff to collect this data. Um, but ideally, it should be built into existing uh, processes of monitoring that they, they often do um, or, or field visits that they often do uh, to communities. So it shouldn't add huge burden on their work, but it is definitely a commitment. Um, this section also provides sample tools. Um, the sample tools are based on uh, the tools that we developed in South Sudan for data collection and we have provided some of them as um, an example of how the tools look and but it but it needs to be contextualized of course to any other context the response monitoring section uh, which goes from page pages 19 to 24 introduces again two components that are recommended for response monitoring. One is coverage monitoring, and the other is monitoring of program quality. Um, we sometimes interchangeably call monitoring of program quality quality monitoring, 
Um, but the reason we try to say monitoring of program quality instead of uh, quality monitoring is that quality monitoring sometimes also means um, a monitoring that is high, of high quality. So to avoid that confusion, we try to mostly say monitoring of program quality. Um, so as I've mentioned before, the first component, which is um, coverage monitoring, can be achieved through existing who does what where um, tools in chop, within child protection uh, sector we often call it the 5w tool um, it's a specific template that the child protection work working group developed a few years ago and it has been improved and used in different contexts um, for the past few years this tool needs to be adapted to be used for coverage monitoring and in the next um, sessions when we get to, to the details of response monitoring I will be explaining in more details what kind of uh, adjustments needs to happen to the 5W tool. Um, but in short, the adjustment will allow us to not only look at the number of children who have received um, programmatic uh, support or services from child protection actors, but also the, the actual type of services that have been provided, broken down into units of services. Um, the next aspect that is addressed in this in this section um, are the methodologies for uh, monitoring the quality um, because for coverage monitoring as I said we can use the five existing 5w tools uh, and normally there is a process already in place within the, the coordination mechanism but for quality monitoring a lot of the time we have to set up a new system um, one way of doing it is using independent um, monitors to go around on a regular basis and collect data on the quality of, of programming and response uh, from different agencies that are providing job protection um, services. The other one is to, to get agencies who are providing the services to monitor themselves. Of course, there are um, advantages and disadvantages to each of these um, methodologies but we'll get to those later another way of doing it potentially which uh, is something that was uh, recommended to us based on an experience uh, in the past is peer-to-peer -peer monitoring and what we mean by that is basically instead of an outsider coming in and monitoring your work or instead of you monitoring your own work we get one agency so let's say um, NGO X is going to monitor the work of NGO Y and NGO Y in return monitors the work of NGO X so basically one NGO monitors the other one the other one monitors that NGO back or it can be a circular situation where NGO X monitors NGO Y NGO Y monitors NGO Z NGO Z monitors NGO X so it's not reciprocal, but you know that one NGO monitors the other one, the next one monitors the next one, and so on and so forth. Um, in this section, we also provide some sample tools based on, mostly based on um, the South Sudan experience, um, but also other tools that are that are there for um, practitioners to take take up and use. Okay, now we get to a bit more practical aspect of establishing a monitoring system. Um, there are 12 steps that will follow. They're very intuitive. Uh, if you have ever established any kind of data collection system or, or even a large scale um, program in the humanitarian context, you probably have gone through certain steps that look similar to these steps. So they're not, nothing fancy. Um, the first recommended step is to convene some sort of an advisory group or a task force because oftentimes if you're dealing with a coordination mechanism there are many members sometimes up to 50 or 60 different members and 
it may not be as effective to discuss the details of a monitoring system with a large group. So you may want to get volunteers from agencies to, um, to basically nominate people who are a bit more well versed in, in monitoring and evaluation, maybe information management um, to be part of this task force or an advisory group. Uh, that work through the details of the of the monitoring system. Um, then you consult with all child protection actors uh, and other humanitarian um, actors um, to determine whether this is even feasible uh, to do. Um, this may involve field visits and actually and going going to the field and seeing how data normally gets collected. Uh, what are the security issues? What are the um, the other practical issues that may affect your ability to collect data. Then identifying existing mechanism that you could potentially use to collect data. Uh, some of these mechanisms may be child protection mechanisms um, and some may be uh, home housed or, or hosted within other, um, other humanitarian sectors like health or um, education. So you have to have an open eye and, a, and an open mind in terms of uh, potentially finding the, the best forum for you to collect the data. You don't always find it but it's good to look and when you're discussing with uh, different humanitarian actors and, and child protection actors uh, it would be important to ask what data collection mechanisms exist so that you don't duplicate things. Um, the next step is uh, to decide on and adapt methodologies um, to use for situation and response monitoring. So it would be important to have the multiple options that are presented in the toolkit, but also, again, it would be important to have open mind in terms of maybe the, the solution for the specific context you're, you're in is a combination of different methodologies, or maybe it's a different methodology that we haven't thought about. Um, and you, you come up with within, within your context. So I have the open mind, but of course, some of the, the methodologies or most of the methodologies that we have recommended have been tested in different contexts and we know that they work. It doesn't mean that they work in every single context, uh, but at least in a context or two, they have proved to be helpful. Um, once you have decided on your methodology, it would be important to adapt your indicators um, and it would be important to make sure that if indicators already exist within the within the con within the context um, so for example the um, the HPC um, indicators that may exist um, the humanitarian program cycle or or other uh, cluster specific or sector specific indicators that um, that may exist or maybe the donors are, are asking um, NGOs or recipients of their funds to report on specific indicators so it would be important to look at all of those pick the best and the most efficient ones so that you don't overburden organizations with reporting on too many indicators but at the same time the indicators are meaningful and can help you make decisions then once you have your indicators, you would want to develop or adapt existing data collection tools and procedures um, so that they fit your context. Um, again, as I mentioned before, there are some sample data collection tools and procedures for situation and response monitoring. Um, those can be used as a base for your adaptation or contextualization. Um, but you can also come up with your own. Uh, do, while doing this, you should also um, be aware that you could potentially use paper-based um, approach to the collection or um, use uh, cell phones or other mobile technology um, like tablets to collect the data. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages and based on your context, you have to analyze them and decide which one is best for you. The next part is uh, preparing the human resource. Uh, you will have to 
If you're going, for example, with independent monitoring approach for response monitoring, you may need to recruit the staff. Or if you're going with agency-based um, uh, or uh, agency-based situation monitoring or response monitoring, you will have to identify them, basically get the NGOs that are involved to nominate who is going to be the enumerator, uh, to collect the data and train them. You may, in, in larger emergency context, you may set up a cascading process of training. You train certain people at the national level, they go down to state level or, or um, kind of smaller administrative units, roll out the training there, and so on and so forth, depending on how many layers you have. Then you have to carry out a field testing. This can actually be done either with or before or after the previous step, depending on, on your context and how much time and resource you have. Ideally, these two steps, seven and eight, um, should go hand in hand. So they're like a chicken and egg situation where field testing will inform your training approach um, because you may adapt some of the tools. But also, once you're training the, tr uh, the, the staff, you would want them to also go out and field test the tools because it doesn't only get them to um, practice, but also it gives, gives them the opportunity to input back into the tools. Um, so you have to decide whether you do it with, alongside the training, or you do it before, or you do it after, or a combination of those. But before I leave step eight, it's very important to always do field testing. Please never use tools without field testing. Uh, once the field testing is done, you have to finalize tools and protocols. A lot of the time you will end up with some significant adjustments that needs to be done either to the tools themselves, the data collection tools, or the, to the procedure of data collection. Uh, for example, how you collect data from children who come into a child-friendly space. That's a process that needs to be tested and you, make, you have to make sure that it works in your context. And based on that, you finalize your tools and protocols. Then you collect, you start collecting the data and um, you have to set up a data management system. Uh, in some contexts, you um, ask each NGO who is collecting the data from different parts of the country or is responsible for that part of the country to collect the data, input them into a, a data management tool, um, sometimes you ask them to analyze it, sometimes you, you ask them to send it to a central point for analysis um, and report writing. Um, or sometimes if you're using, for example, tablets, all the data may be uploaded to a server and then um, at a central point, there's someone or a group uh, or a team that get access to the data and can analyze it and, um, and report it back. Analysis, interpretation, and sharing of data. Analysis, as I mentioned, is, is basically just the process of getting the data together, making sense of them, summarizing them. But then we also want to, on a regular basis, interpret what the data means. And this, that means that just looking at how many communities have reported separation of children may not be enough for you to be able to adjust your programming. You, you need to, to sit down with those who understand the context, with those who are expert in, uh, in programming, in child protection programming, um, and those who were involved in the data collection itself, and come up with ways of connecting the analysis to, to response. And that process we call interpretation. So we need to interpret the, the analysis that has been done to uh, better make, make better recommendations. Um, and then you have to make sure that there is reports that go back to those who collect the data, because otherwise, um, after a while, you start seeing that people who don't get any feedback from what they have been reporting on, they start losing um, kind of enthusiasm and they, they stop producing the data. So it would be important to, to report back to them what uh, you have analyzed. And the last step is basically process of reviewing the, 
the functioning of the monitoring mechanism to make sure that everything is going well and if there is lessons that you learn from or mistakes that you make uh, you use those to improve the monitoring uh, process. The indicator section, um, pages 30 and 31, um, provide some definitions and, and also guidance on how um, qualitative and quantitative indicators uh, can be used and what they are um, and how you can use them in the, in the CP monitoring process. Um, there's also an annex, Annex 1, in this current uh, version, Draft 5 of the, of the toolkit that provides detailed definitions um, for different types of um, indicators um, and also some other kind of foundational um, definitions like what is a smart indicator um, but in this annex you will get go into more details of definitions for for example if you're talking about situation monitoring what a situational indicator is if you're talking about response monitoring what an input indicator is what an output indicator is um, what a quality indicator is, uh, or, a qual or an indicator to measure quality, rather. Uh, so all of those are outlined here. The sampling and selection of participants section, uh, which runs from page 32 to 35 um, in draft 5 of the toolkit, provide um, some description of why we sample. Uh, it talks about what a unit of measurement is. Um, and also gives you a sense of what the general proposed sampling approaches are for situation and response monitoring. Just to give you a sense for situation monitoring, depending on the data collection method, you may use different types of sampling. Um, but in general, we use purposive sampling uh, of sentinel sites uh, for uh, situation monitoring. For response monitoring, it also depends on what data collection methods you you selected. Um, if agency self-monitoring is selected, again, purposive sampling uh, will be used. But more details will come in the following sessions. Data collection and staffing section, pages 36 and 37 of the current uh, version, um, provide a little bit of um, description on uh, the frequency of or uh, some ideas about the frequency of data collection what staffing requirements there are um, and the data collection process itself um, and it also lays out a little bit of kind of a job description or what is expected from the manager of, of a response monitoring project what information manager and also enumerators um, the last uh, section is uh, about data analysis and, and sharing of information. It's on page 37. Um, it talks about the data management tools. Uh, there is, um, so the, the data management, the three data management tools that are described. One is the adapted 5W tool, gives you a sense of what adaptations are required and how you can use it. A program quality um, data management tool, which, which is specifically linked to the, as the data management of response quality monitoring, and uh, situation monitoring data management tool, which is specifically linked to situation monitoring. Again, all of these will have to be adapted based on your context, or rather contextualized um, based on your humanitarian situation but they are all available and they will greatly help you and facilitate the process of entering the data and getting um, basic analysis out um, of the data management tool.